This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, have you got yourself a PR Podcast plug yet? We've been talking about it the last few weeks. It's our new feature at the top of the show. It's right here. It comes right before our guest intro where we promote your passion project. Could be your blog, could be your website, uh, could be your hobby, could even be your own podcast. Don't be shy. Drop us a line at the PR podcast on Twitter and let us plug your thing in an upcoming episode. Now on to our guest. Let's get right into it. Bill Coletti is CEO and founder of Kith, a crisis communications agency based in Austin, Texas. Bill is a C-suite advisor, global crisis comms expert, reputation management strategist, and a speaker. Innovative, adaptive, and creative, Bill focuses his clients on risk management, crisis leadership and management, strategic communications, and so much more. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about today. Bill, welcome to the PR Podcast. Jody, I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks for making some time for us. What defines a crisis for you? So there's tons of classic definitions out there. I think a crisis is a moment that takes two components to it. It takes an organization off of its strategy. They woke up that morning, that month, that quarter, that year, and they had a strategy. They had, a, they had things they wanted to execute and they wanted to accomplish. So a crisis, one aspect is that it takes you off of that strategy. And two is that it gets public attention. And the distinction is there are plenty of business issues that take us off strategy. I mean, we could have you know, a supply chain issue, probably not a crisis like you and I would talk about it, but it takes you off strategy. The second component is that it gets public attention and whether that public be your employees, your customers, or the New York Times or 60 Minutes, but it's it it's an, an event, a moment that takes you away from your strategy and has the potential or already does has the attention of the public. When we think of crisis, and especially when us PR people get together, we think of crisis, we typically default to the media crisis or the PR crisis, but mm -hmm. that's really not the core problem. The core problem is we've got an issue. And, and I remember uh, working uh, at a university um, and there were a couple of, let's say, overly dramatic people around who loved to scream, we have a crisis and rally everybody in the boardroom. There was one dean of one of the schools who used to come in in his little sweater vest, uh, <laughs> and very quiet man would look around the room at everybody scurrying and he would say, is anybody dead? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. So um, using that framework, <laughs> mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what really needs, what really defines a crisis and, and, and what, um, I guess, what, what are sort of maybe the levels of crisis um, that you take your clients through? Yeah, you know, it's interesting and and speaking just very frankly, when we've dealt with situations of death, obviously that gets everybody's attention. But without being cavalier, and I am a very compassionate person, that's a relatively binary situation. It either is or it isn't. And so talk of my litig litigation colleagues is they would much rather um, have a situation where someone died in a workplace accident then was injured long term. And it's kind of tragic. And I don't mean that at all crassly. And I, and I appreciate your feedback that, that you get what I'm saying. I would disagree with the sweater vested guy as I don't think if anybody's dead, we now don't have a crisis. I think there are situations where you could have a mass casualty event, you could have a shooter on campus, things like that. So we work with clients that have those situations. But I think there's a lot that can go on around issues related to these societal issues and let's just stay with higher ed societal issues that impact campuses you know what are we going to do around free speech free speech what are we going to do about lbgtq issues how are we going to manage black lives matter i think those long tail issues can have a lot of implications for recruitment and retention and while you may be out of the newspaper 
people are going to be paying attention as they're making choices and spending finite dollars on where they're going to go to school or a faculty or where parents want their kids to go to school. And then you add into that where we, we sadly still see on campus sexual harassment. We see sort of workplace incidents, um, maybe newsworthy and noteworthy, but certainly get the attention of the public, um, people that are making those decisions. And then you just have issues is that you do weird things on college campuses, particularly in the health department. And, you know, we've, we've had a, we had a client that they were doing a, a healthcare procedure that typically was done on mannequins, but this professor thought it would be better to do on live people and, and particularly related to, to women's health. And that's an issue. And, and those are things nobody died. And so your, our sweater vested friend, you know, might be sort of missing the mark. I appreciate his, his calm and confidence, but maybe missing the mark a little bit. Well, and, and that brings up a good point, you know, and to what you originally said, which was, you know, death or something like it is binary, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the example that you just gave us, uh, extraordinarily more nuanced. Totally. Lots of different moving parts and pieces and things like that. Um, Absolutely. And, and then when you pivot to issues types of crises mm -hmm. uh, where there are, you know, um, speech issues involved or where there are rights issues involved, mm -hmm. um, that can start to speak to having a plan in place to deal with these kind of things. And, and offline, we were talking about how one of the most important things that we can do as, as PR counselors um, and just as counselors, never mind mm -hmm. media or, or PR, um, is having a series of plans and places to deal with what we'll call ongoing issues, as opposed to the thing dropping from the sky. It's right. sort of these things that you have to deal with day in and day out, like, you know, people on Twitter, people on social media, things like that, or things that might happen on campus. You can sort of categorize some of these things that might happen. Do you work with your clients to put plans in place to deal with those things and then kind of pull the playbook out of the drawer? We do, we do. We've got a very, um, it's, it's becoming a less contrarian view of plans. And so I tell the anecdote is we moved in, we, I was working with a, a major fortune 25 company and they wanted me to come review the 38 crisis binders that they had over the head of communication shoulder. And they literally had 38 ranging from, you know, airplane accidents, CEO death to data breach, you name it, they had 38 of them. And that used to be standard practice is that agency folks like you and I got paid a whole lot of money to write every different permutation of a plan. Um, but I don't think that's the future. I think what we need to be right now is we need to be better. We talk about speed, clarity, and trust. And I think the key differentiator between great and good crisis response is speed, being fast to the market. So the plan needs to A, make you fast, the way you get fast is being crystal clear on what do you stand for? What are your mission and values? And then lastly, what's your chain of command? How you make decisions? So I think an A to Z you know, encyclopedia of all of the different permutations of bad things that could happen in the world is a bad idea. Figuring out what you stand for, figuring out who and, and how decisions are made, that will make you fast build in some generic holding statements, build in some components so that you're, you, you basically have assigned people, this is the spokesperson, this is the decision maker, here's who needs to know. Those are the building blocks we think are more critical in a plan than A to Z crisis of the day, um, where you've got these 38 binders over your shoulder. I don't think that's appropriate. I think you need some building blocks that let you get fast then live to fight another day because very rarely do these situations are just solved pop and it's over there's a little bit of process that it takes and the tool the plan is to help expedite that process who needs to be at the table or who needs to be in that chain of command in your uh, your perception yeah so i think there's sort of four key components um obviously senior leadership whatever that gets defined as um and how sort of what that is and i'd put the board of directors the ceo president things like that general counsel legal because typically there's some sort of legal expertise or legal implication the subject matter expert what department or division or where did this happen um in the business and then the last uh, role that i think is critical 
is communications. So there's, you can add a fifth, you can add a sixth, you can add a seventh, but I think those four executive leadership, legal operations, which is what I call subject matter expert, and then communications, if those four are well represented, um, you can then pull in HR as necessary. You can pull in different resources, but those are the critical four that I think are necessary. Bill, your book, Critical Moments, uh, The New Mindset of Reputation Management, um, talks uh, a lot about this. And, and the, the line that really uh, pulled me in with, was, a company owns its brand, but the public owns its reputation. Um, a, really, a really interesting perspective, and, and I like the way it sounds, but I want you to, to spool that out a little bit for us. How does the public own a company or an entity's reputation? Sure. So, you know, the, the, the classic example is BP. All right. So Deepwater Horizon tragedy in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't spend money at BP because it's not convenient from my office to my house. There's a shell station that's just easier for me to go to. So I'm not a customer of BP. Shell spends a lot of money on that brand experience that I have and, and all of the things that they do because I'm a customer. I have a relationship with them. BP, on the other hand, I just have an opinion of them. I'm the public. I'm not the customer. I have an opinion of them because I grew up in Florida and I care about the Florida beaches and I care about offshore drilling and things like that. And so companies can control the user experience. If you're in retail, you can change the temperature and the lights and the smell. You can change all these aspects of the brand experience, the features and benefits of the product. But it's the public, me for BP in that case, that that's what companies need to think about. So reputation is born not from the relationship with economic customers, that's brand. I'm talking about it from non-economic customers because they determine and really dictate an organization's license to operate. Um, and that has less to do, particularly in a B2B context, that has less to do with the brand experience. So what kind of things factor into that reputation? Uh, I had an experience th this uh, week with a client who uh, we frequently d does a lot of philanthropic stuff and we're mm -hmm. you know frequently putting out press releases about they donated money to this mm -hmm. cause or they're supporting that cause or whatever and then they just hired somebody and that new hire said I keep reading about you in the newspaper doing all this stuff this is an organization I want to work for mm -hmm. um, is it is it stuff like that? Sure, or, or it's employee it, endorsement. Employee endorsement is is absolutely the case. Sort of, and I think that in charitable and philanthropic activities, the book we talk about. There's a handful of them that I think are out there. I think that are you a good trade partner? Do you do are you do what you say and do you deliver um, on time? There's a service delivery component to this. But are you a good trade partner, particularly in a B two B context? Um, are you innovative? Do your products meet not just the immediate need, but are you future thinking? Um, I think there's a whole tapestry of things that we can do that are innovative, that grow reputation. And there's, there's these handful of areas. Um, is your CEO, what is the, there's a, it's very personified around an individual leader um, and their reputation. And so I think there's a handful of that. Are you economically sound? Do you continue to grow your balance sheet? Are you strong? I think all of those things factor into reputation different than the relationship that we have with the customer. The number one, I think, is sort of obviously, how do you contribute back to society? It can be with checks, write a check to United Way. It could also be, are you trading with Myanmar? Are you getting your supply chain from Russia? Uh, things like that. And so I think all of those aspects fit together. There's about seven, uh, and I think they're relatively, you can sort of understand and, and be mindful of all of them. And so does having that reputation help you when crisis absolutely the phrase drops from the sky? Absolutely. And so I think you get kind of you get a hand you get three main things from that. One is that having a strong reputation, you get the benefit of the doubt. And so that's not Jody Incorporated, I know. That's not the company I know. And you get the benefit of the doubt if there's some sort of crisis event that's there. So that's the one thing, and that's sort of really primary when we're in these crisis situations. If you're in a if you're in a crisis situation and it's a relative to another company, I think having a strong reputation breaks ties. The, the firm with the stronger reputation will get that a that benefit of the doubt. But if there's a tie, who do I believe? The one with this patina of the stronger reputation, 
uh, will will maintain will help will help sort of grow those relationships and, and break those ties, um, you know. And then and then lastly is you get the license to operate. Is that you then get the opportunity to expand your market, to go into new areas, to go into new um, uh, business lines, and run your organization you see fit. Directly response to crisis is that you get the benefit of the doubt. And so if I were to say a handful of companies, Starbucks, Walmart, and BP, one of those you might give the benefit of the doubt to, two of them you might be a little bit skeptical and say, yeah, I believe that they did that. I think Star Starbucks has a really high reputation firm. BP's had a couple of little dings to their reputation. United Airlines, maybe, yeah, I'm not, if, if, if I told you they just did something, your memory banks would say, yeah, I remember they did that thing to that doctor where they dragged him off a plane a couple years ago. That was a bad thing. Um, and so I think we, 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 shape our, we shape our beliefs around companies over the long term um, on sort of how they act. And so I think from a crisis standpoint, is you want to get the benefit of the doubt that that's, that's not the company I know. Yeah, a company that springs to my mind is Apple. Um, sure. and, and not just because I'm a fan of their products, but because they have, I think, an excellent reputation. They certainly have been out in front on um, data collection and privacy in a way that few, if any, other major tech companies have been. Yeah. Um, and even taking a juxtaposing point of view, whereas if you, if you think of the opposite of the walk that Apple has done around privacy, mm -hmm. Facebook is the exact opposite. opposite. You know, and Facebook has this reputation, to your point, of collecting all your data, of taking yeah. all your data and selling it, and and you know farming it out to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, and if I were to say. Yeah, there's a company in the news in technology that has this relatively relatively draconian employee ranking system where they evaluate their employees based on on more than just KPIs, but evaluate them basically on where they came from, uh, their health, and whether they're going to have a child. Which company do you think would be between Facebook and Apple? Do you think which company do you think I'm talking about? Now that's totally made up, but our minds. Are like yeah that's those guys it's not and everybody's those, it's listening not those guys. just had said something in their mind right everybody yeah. had <laughs> yeah someone that and that's totally made up i just riffed on that i have no idea i don't know what a draconian <laughs> a, a draconian help you know employee ranking system is but we would just saying that we think about that and now on the apple example They've had challenges with subcontractors, with Foxconn and some of their employees in the, in the manufacturing process, but they handled it really well. And you and I, both as Apple fans, gave them the benefit of the doubt. If I found out that another company that I didn't feel as positively about had people committing suicide, jumping out of the building, I would probably rethink my purchase process. But Apple handled it well. 100% agree with you. Absolutely. Um, there are a ton of crises. This is kind of a loaded question. I was going to ask you, what crises do you see in the world today? I mean, even just this morning when we're taping this, there is a crisis uh, breaking for Applebee's out mm -hmm. in the Midwest. I don't know if you heard about it. You probably heard about that one already. Mm -hmm. A memo that a local franchisee sent out, and it was not so nice. Um, but are there crises that stick out to you these days um, that... that um, that fit into one of the categories that we've been talking about, either a crisis that um, could have been avoided, uh, a crisis that is deadened because uh, of, of a company's reputation, you know, solid reputation. Um, are there some examples maybe you can throw out that you like for one or an another reason? Yeah, you know, I'm, I don't know how it's gonna turn out. So I'm curious to watch it unfold is Disney. I think what Disney, particularly with Don't Say Gay in Florida um, and that they, didn't or did do what stakeholders expected. And it was a little herky jerky with the new CEO relative to the previous CEO. That's when I don't know exactly how that's gonna play out. I think every day that goes by, it gets a little bit better for management in that context. Um, but I think we're gonna see, I'm a Floridian, so I kind of watch sort of the internals of Florida a little bit. Um, you know, there, there's, we'll see how that plays out. And Disney's got a pretty outsized role in politics in Florida. And so we'll sort of see how that one plays out. Um, you know, I, you can't have this conversation without talking about COVID. And it's r silly to think that COVID two, or two years later now feels, still feels like a crisis. But I think 
it made us all better. I think crisis, I think COVID was a great accelerator. It just accelerated things that were already happening. And one of the things that accelerated among many is that it forced leaders to speak. It forced leaders to say, I don't know, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Here's what I, th I think we're gonna be back in September. I think we're gonna be back in 2022, back to work. And so I think it forced leaders to speak. So I think that has been a good thing. I think other crises that we're dealing with, I, I think that the that the power of Me Too has been so overwhelming that I think that men in particular, and we have done a lot of this work, is that men in particular, if they get called out uh, on the in, the in the aspect of sexual harassment and Me Too, there's not a lot of safe harbor uh, for men, and so I see that um, having changed. Is that there was uh, room. Uh, for men to, to articulate a defense, it's becoming more difficult, um, either rightly or wrongly, not, not, not you know, prejudging these situations. Um, but I think those are a handful. Another one that's in the news that's breaking, I'm just as an observer, what's going to happen with um, Supreme Court Justice Thomas and his wife? And, you know, it's not corporate, it's politics. Uh, but I do think it's a laboratory. Somebody's going to have to say something about something eventually. Nobody said anything. Uh, so I think those are those are a handful of things uh, that we're watching. I think we're going to see all kinds of new things about face masks, uh, particularly on aviation, uh, on how are we going to handle that. People that are going to like it because they just feel safe. You're in a metal, you're in a metal tube, and I just like wearing a mask uh, or not. And so I think we're going to how how people are going to deal with those situations are things we should be looking out for. In terms of crisis, and maybe as we bring this conversation to a close here, um, are there moments where no comment or some version of that is appropriate in a crisis situation. And what would some of those examples be? Yeah, you know, that that is a, it's an age old question. You know, the, the, you've got some people that are just definitively and say, you know, no comment is horrible. Never say no comment. And I've been in situations where it is the, it is the best worst option to just say no comment because we're not ready we don't know what's going on and the leader that would say it is actually a poor spokesperson so i'm not i don't believe in sort of universalities is that thou shalt not ever do this um i would prefer not to do it i think we are getting better society corporate society is getting better at saying um you know we don't know enough at this time but we're going to get back to you in an hour um or um, we're not going to talk about that right now, but I'm happy to follow up with you. So there's there's tactical ways to get around it, um, but I don't believe that you can say never, never. And I'm curious your reaction to it. I don't think never, never, never do it is is really good guidance because you can do more harm than good um, by saying something even though you think you're saying nothing. Um, and and you stories need antagonists and protagonists, you need two actors. And if you starve the story, there is a strategy where uh, there is a potential uh, to do that. If someone jams, a, you know, you're on the courthouse step and someone jams a microphone in your face, it's sometimes difficult to get away with that. But I don't believe in absolutes. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I don't believe in absolutes either. And, and I try to avoid the phrase no comment, yeah. because we've been all been conditioned to believe that no comment e equals guilt. Yes. And, and so and so we you we don't use those two words together. Yeah. Um, but we do I've got nothing to add, nothing to say. I mean, we exactly. can, that's tactics. We can figure that out. Yeah. Right, exactly. And and the whole um and, and my philosophy about it um is that um you want to be telling your story so mm -hmm. someone else doesn't tell your story. Absolutely. So so whatever you can lend to the story in the in the news cycle that you're in on the deadline that the reporters are on mm -hmm. you tell your version of that story at that moment in time and then you do your work to meet the next news cycle deadline yeah um and you expand upon the story but you're always saying the thing you want to say at this moment don't let someone else tell your story yeah. um it, just because i think then then you you put yourself in a corner and, and you're working from negative space yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we do in crisis simulations when we're working with clients is is really tensioning them around saying something with limited limited information. We are all trained as business people to perfect information and then share it. That's the the classic American corporate memo is perfected information that then gets shared. 
and we write it and rewrite it and draft it, whether we're going to open up a new factory, we write a plan and it's really well perfected. We like to create tension so people have to operationalize on imperfect information, which is often the case, as you know, that's often the case we find our clients in. Um, and that's not a very comfortable space for people that are operators uh, and for a lot of different leaders. So experiencing imperfect information is a very, very good skill to practice. That is a terrific concept. I love that. And a great place to, to wind up our conversation here, Bill. Thank you so much for taking the time with us. We are, Thank you. We are going to segue now into the rapid fire question portion of our podcast. This is where we steal a page from inside the actor's studio, ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions meant to elicit just a simple answer or two. By your smile, I can tell you, Bill, you're game. Ready? Uh, I'm so all here in. here we go. I'm all in. Rapid fire question. Number one, what is your favorite news source? My favorite news source would be the New York Times. I just think I love the comprehensive and the breadth of what they do. Rapid fire question number two, what's your favorite social media platform? Twitter. It's also my favorite news source, but I figure I, I have a little cliche <laughs> to say it's my favorite, but well, I think Twitter is my and it's funny, favorite news source. The last few guests that we've had on, they jump right in with that and they say, oh, my favorite news source is Twitter. And I can agree with that in, in, you know, in concept. Yeah. Twitter, Twitter reminds me of the, the old AP news feed. Totally. You know, there was a printer over in the corner of the newsroom and it was just spitting out information. Twitter to me is the same thing. And I would love Twitter to go back to a, to a linear yeah. uh, feed. I don't want to see someone's tweet from three, three days ago. I want to see no, it. I lose, like, I lose context. Yeah. Right. Are, are you uh, of a certain age where you can call that the ticker? Would you call absolutely. it? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Rapid fire question. Number three, coffee or alcohol? Coffee, coffee, All good, right. good pour over coffee. I always Absolutely. have mine, always have my Yeti filled. Absolutely. Rapid fire question number four, what is your favorite on the run food? Uh, you know, I guess a good Austin, Texas breakfast burrito. Can't beat it. Just oh, works you got me in, the airport. in the airport. It's just a go-to thing. And I go to other airports when I'm flying home and I can rarely find one, something that simple. There you go. Rapid fire question number five, what do you want to be after you finish this career? A uh, sailing instructor. I would love to teach uh families husbands and wives how to be competent and confident sailors charter charter boat captains uh but to be able to take their families on amazing vacations in the caribbean that is very cool i like that i've been sailing a i've been sailing a couple times and i actually did the sailing once mm -hmm. and i was frightened out of my mind <laughs> <laughs> so I want to teach there's you ropes to... flying and there's jibs going all over the place. And like, yep. what do I do now? Someone else. I want to teach it. people to be competent and confident. And, and that's exactly what I would love to do. Sounds like a great post career career for a crisis PR guy. <laughs> 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 well, Bill, this has been a great conversation. Please let people know how they can find you online. So we are remarkably old school, good, good full fashion website, just kits.co. You can find just about everything there. Get a hold of me there. Pretty active on LinkedIn, Bill Coletti, uh, and uh, on Twitter as well, B Coletti. Um, and then Jody, we're gonna have a uh, just a landing page for you guys, you know, kith.co backslash um, PR podcast so people can find out information. Um, some of the things we talked about if they want something more specific. So if that's a resource people can check out, but it's at kith, K-I-T-H dot C-O. That's terrific. And you are the first guest to actually set up a special landing page like that. We're going to make sure we post the link cool. to our social media so that people can find that as well. Good. Hopefully well, that's helpful. Thanks again, Bill. And thank you everyone for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the PR podcast, and send us a question or comment. Our intro is by Christopher Apple. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A P P O L D T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast.